All right, we're going to look at early atomic theory and quantum theory as well. So, um, the ancient Greeks sort of thought that maybe matter would be made up of particles, and then we had the idea of these four essential elements and all matter being made up of that, and that sort of stuck around for a few thousand years. But um, starting in the early 1800s, um, John Dalton was one of the first ones to think of and, and sort of use evidence to prove a scientific method that atoms are in fact made up of particles as the ancient Greeks thought a while ago before that. Um, so essentially his idea was that you have matter made up of particles and these particles themselves cannot be divided. So it is the fundamental point in which you get to if you start taking a piece of something and cut it into smaller and smaller pieces, eventually you're going to uh, Eventually, you're going to get to a point where you get to a particle that cannot be divided. So he thought atoms were indivisible. And there would be different types of particles. So we knew that there were different elements at this point. Um, so you might have one element that is of one type and one element that is of another type. Let's say this one's hydrogen and maybe this one's helium. Um, but both of them are just spheres that cannot be divided any further. So we went with this idea for a little while. But eventually, um, we found that through experimentation again, um, there are some things that exist that are actually part of atoms, but not atoms themselves. They're, they're smaller than atoms. And uh, Crookes was the one who did this using a cathode ray tube, and essentially passing a current through a tube that has had most of the gases sucked out of it. And he was able to see that there are these tiny little particles in here um, and he found that they had a negative charge to them and they were a component of atoms, but they were not atoms themselves. So these eventually got the name of electrons. And so atoms weren't the smallest thing around anymore. So Thompson was the next guy to take this idea and say, okay, well, let's, let's incorporate this into our model of the atom. And so essentially he did, he said, okay, well, let's just take our previously existing model as we do in science and let's add in the new evidence to improve that model. And so if atoms have these things called electrons in them, let's just have our billiard ball model and we will have these tiny little electrons embedded within them. So we had a positive sphere, or Thompson thought that atoms were this positive sphere, sort of loose, um, positive material, not particularly dense. And within that positive sphere, there were these negative electrons embedded in them. So that was our next model of the atom. However, Rutherford tested out this model using the classic gold foil experiment. And so essentially, he took a piece of gold foil and he took a radioactive source that emits alpha particles. So imagine there's this thing shooting these tiny little positively charged particles at this piece of gold foil. And so these particles came flying out and he saw that they actually went right through the gold foil. They had a screen on the other side and they, they gave off a little light every time they hit. And so this part so far agreed with Thompson's model is that if, if they have these atoms that are these spheres with a positive um, charge with these native electrons in them, these tiny little alpha particles, which are really high energy and positively charged, they should have no problem going through the atom if the atom looks like Thompson said it does. But what was interesting was that not all of them went right through. Some of them got deflected off at an angle and they ended up over here. And some of them bounced right off the gold foil and it ended up over here. So this is this is Rutherford's gold foil experiment to probe what is going on in an atom, what, what is actually happening here. According to Thompson, all of them should have gone through. So Rutherford doing the gold foil experiment, um, essentially discovered the nucleus by shooting alpha particles at a piece of gold foil, expecting them to go through. Most of them did, but some of them were deflected by something going on inside the atom. So Thompson's model was correct. They should have all gone through. They didn't, so there had to be something more going on. So what 
Rutherford thought was, okay, well, these, these are positive alpha particles and they're being deflected by something inside the atom. So if the positive alpha particles are being deflected by something, that thing itself must be positive as well. And since most of them went right through, whatever is deflecting the few that didn't go through must also be quite small. And in order to deflect a high energy alpha particle, it must also be quite dense. So we got the idea of those, those three properties of the nucleus. It is very small, it is positively charged, and it's very dense from the gold foil experiment. Um, Chadwick uh, theorized that there's this other thing in the nucleus um, that don't have a charge, and so we ended up, we know those are neutrons now. To explain isotopes, we won't get into the details of that. But essentially, a Rutherford atom consists of a very, very, very small, very dense, positively charged nucleus with these electrons around it. Um, we didn't say much about what those electrons are doing around the nucleus, but that they, there was a nucleus. So this brings us to the next part, those electrons themselves. And it takes a little bit of background information to figure out how Bohr got to his idea. So let's go through this, and this is gonna be our, our quick introduction to quantum theory. So two separate observations are important to, to understanding how we got to this quantum model of the atom um, using Bohr's information. The first one is atomic spectra. And basically what this is, is that if you have a substance and so here's a candle, um, it's burning and it's, it's atoms are getting excited and they, if you excite atoms, they will give off light. And so, so we've known that when you burn stuff, you get light, that's essentially what, what fire is, it's heated gases um, and they give off light. If you analyze that light, you can get more information about it, more details of it. So if you pass white light through a prism, prism, the prism will spread the light out and we can actually see all of the different components of that light. So people were studying the different light given off by substances. Um, Bohr's model had the electrons sort of willy-nilly all over the nucleus. You had a nucleus in the middle, and you can think of this as a sort of like moths flying around a light bulb. They're sort of just flying all over the place around that light bulb. They're attracted to it, um, but they're just, there's no particular order as to where they happen to be. Um, because of that, they should be acting in a particular way. If you have a charge that is moving, um, in a circle, it, it's technically it's accelerating, and we know that charges that are accelerating should be giving off a continuous spectrum of light. So, if this is how atoms are, they should be giving off a constant continuous spectrum of light. And we would see that on the visible spectrum, anyways. If you looked at it, we should see all the colors of the rainbow. So, if you take any substance that's atoms, you heat it up. They, if if um, the uh, Rutherford model was correct, we should see all of those light given off by those electrons, which are all over the place around the nucleus. But this is not the case. That's not what you see. What you see instead is based on what element you're talking about. So let's say this is sodium. When you look at sodium when it's excited, it doesn't give off a continuous whole spectrum. You don't see the whole rainbow. You only see a small portion of it. And then if you heat up uh, HG uh, mercury, it gives off, and not the whole rainbow, but also only specific portions of the rainbow. Not all the energies, only some of the energies. So these are called line spectrum. They end up seeing only certain lines. If you look at lithium, when it's excited, it only gives off particular energies, particular lines. It should have been all of them. If Rutherford's idea of having electrons everywhere was correct, but we didn't see all of the energies. We only saw specific ones. So, the second thing we need to consider is what's called the photoelectric effect. Um, and this is when light hits metal, that's observed in the right conditions. Um, if you hit a piece of metal, so here, here's a piece of metal, it's made up of atoms. Um, if you hit it with the right type of light, electrons will come flying off of it. But, what was interesting is if you hit it with a, a uh, different type of light, so we shine another light at it, maybe no electrons are lost or ejected. So certain colors cause electrons to be ejected and other ones don't. And the intensity didn't matter. So it doesn't matter how much light you hit it with, it may not do anything. So let's say we shine all sorts of yellow light at it, nothing happens. 
but we shine a little bit of purple light at it and we get those ejection of electrons. That was, that was what the photoelectric effect was. And we didn't know why this was for a long period of time. The color of light seems to matter, but we didn't know why. So um, looking at the, these heated bits of matter giving off energy, um, this guy named Planck, he theorized, okay, well, maybe what's going on is that um, energy may not be a continuous. So, so maybe it's not that you can just have high energy and low energy and anywhere in between, which is sort of what we think. You think if you have a, a, a volume button, you could turn it up or turn it down and get any spots in between. That's how we traditionally thought of energy. But what Planck was saying is, okay, well, maybe you can only have certain levels. You can have this level of energy, or you can have that level of energy, or this level of energy, but it is not possible to have somewhere in between those levels of energy. So this was Planck's idea. Einstein took these ideas and, and put them together. So he essentially, he won Nobel Prize um, for coming up with the idea of photons or the idea that light can come in the form of packets, energy packets, which we now know are photons. So if light comes as packets, photons, um, perhaps their energy is described by the color of though that light or those photons. So if a photon doesn't have enough energy, no amount of them can displace the electrons in the metal, seen in the photoelectric effect. If a photon does have the right amount of energy, or it is a particular color, so that the color is the amount of energy it has, um, then they will be able to displace those electrons. Sort of think of it like a, a, a vending machine. You can go to a vending machine and you can put a penny in and it'll spit the penny back out because it doesn't take pennies. And so if you're trying to buy a chocolate bar for a dollar, theoretically you could give it a hundred pennies and it should give you a chocolate bar, but you can give it a thousand pennies and it won't give you anything. That's not the right type of uh, item that the vending machine needs. So photons are kind of like that, is that if you're using photons of a low energy, it doesn't matter how many you use, it's not gonna be able to knock those electrons off of those metal atoms. But you come along, you put a loony into your vending machine, you get your chocolate bar. Same thing with the photons. If you use the right type of photon, maybe a purple photon, it does have enough energy to displace those electrons. And so this is how we came up with the idea that light is no longer just a wave. It still is a wave, but it's not just a wave. But it also can act like a particle. So light can be a wave and a particle. So Bohr took this idea and said, okay, well, if, if light can be quantized and into particles, maybe we can do the same thing with electrons in the other direction. So we think of electrons as being particles. But what Bohr did is, that, well, maybe they can have properties of waves as well. And so if light can be waves and particles, maybe electrons can be particles and waves. And we can have properties of the electrons following what waves do. And this is the idea that electrons, maybe, um, can only have certain energies. So the spectra lines that we see, the fact that we see, if you had a line spectrum, you may only have certain lines of light, certain types of light given off by a particular element. That is due to the fact that the electrons around that element can only be in certain spots. So when given a certain amount of energy, the right amount of energy, electrons can change their spot around the nucleus. So if we imagine, instead of just mollusks willy-nilly around the, the, the nucleus, um, imagine them as being in a particular spot. So if we have them, say, in the original spot, we could give them some energy. So say, heat them up or hit them with a photon of light, and then they will exist then into another place around that nucleus. Um, we call the low one the ground state, and anything higher than the ground state would be an excited state. So when the, the electrons have more energy, they can exist at a higher energy state, but not anywhere, only in particular spots. And that's where we get that planetary model, is that not that electrons can't be anywhere around the nucleus, they can only be in specific spots. When the electron releases some energy, so let's say this electron here releases some energy, then it can exists back down on a lower energy level. And again, the low one's called the, the ground state. 
So the alphabet is linear. Why isn't the periodic table? And it used to be we used to just have a list of elements, um, listing them in order from small to big. Um, but then Mendeleev came along and he said, okay, well, let's look at the properties of these and let's start grouping them by their properties. So we can go hydrogen and helium, but then we get to lithium and lithium kind of acts a little bit like hydrogen in terms of how it, it reacts in bonds. And we go lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Um, and we say, okay, it's for neon. When we get to sodium, sodium acts kind of like lithium does. And we keep going along, and eventually we get to potassium, and potassium kind of acts like sodium, which kind of acts like lithium, which kind of acts like hydrogen. So we have this repeating pattern um, of properties within the periodic table. And that's what Mendeleev used to arrange the elements, not as a list, but as a periodic table, periodically repeating patterns and line them up accordingly. Um, Bohr's model now explain this because when you have the electrons anywhere, um, like moles around a, a light bulb, it doesn't really explain it. But if they can only be in specific spots, then maybe there's a pattern to those specific spots. Maybe the, the electrons around potassium have a similarity to the electron arrangement around sodium, which has a similarity to the electron arrangement around lithium. So if they're arranged in a similar way, they'll end up exhibiting similar properties. And this is how we got to our, our different periods in the periodic table. So each period corresponds to a particular energy level in the atom. So we can all draw a bohr rutherford diagrams. Um, so we know that hydrogen has one electron and helium has two electrons. Um, but then lithium kind of acts like hydrogen. So instead of putting three electrons in that first energy, so okay, well, let's make it look like hydrogen. And we'll put one in the outer shell and the other two are on the inner shell. And then we can keep going. Let's get it to, to the neon here and we'll get to sodium. So let's do neon. We have two on the inner one. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, um, and helium and neon act similarly. They have full outer shells, but sodium, we're going to add it over to the side here. We would say, okay, well, sodium acts a lot like lithium. So it has, lithium has one in the outer shell. Sodium also has one in the outer shell. So let's just draw these ones here. And so what we're seeing is that that repeating pattern in terms of the properties of the elements, lithium reacts kind of like sodium reacts, is due to the placement of electrons. The fact that we have one outer electron in the outer shell for sodium and one outer electron in lithium's outer shell um, causes them to have similar properties. So the properties are due to the electron arrangement. And again, if you get down to potassium, I'll do the whole thing, but it acts like sodium because it has a similar electron arrangement to sodium, which is similar to lithium. And we have a periodic repeating patterns. The periodic table has been arranged according to those patterns. So, um, why are there only particular energy level spots for electrons? So, so why, why do we have electrons in shell number one and electrons in shell number two, but not in one and a half or one and three quarters or any other denomination between the two of them? Um, and what I always think about this is to think of electrons as waves and, and think about their um, wave-like properties. So we can draw a wave, so let's draw a line for our wave to exist on and let's draw a wave on it. So we can do a full wavelength like that. Um, if you ever played with a skipping rope or a slinky and you've got them, they got a partner and you get that slinky waving, you can actually get it to exist as a standing wave. Um, so if we think of electrons as waves, they can exist as standing waves. But if they try to exist as anything but a standing wave, the wave itself collapses in itself. And if you're trying to wiggle a, a, a skipping rope back and forth, um, it can collapse in on itself if you don't have a standing wave. So let's draw another one over here. So imagine there's another standing wave. Um, I'm going to draw two standing waves, one, two wavelengths as a standing wave. So we can have one wavelength or we can have two wavelengths. So if we try to go from one wave, one standing wavelength to two standing wavelengths, it can be one or the other, but it can't exist 
has one and a half standing wave length. You can't get a stable standing wave when you only have one and a half wavelengths. You can do it with one wavelength, you can do it with two wavelengths, but if you try to do anything in the middle, the wave itself collapses. So electrons act like this. They can exist as standing waves in only particular full wavelengths. So if we saw, um, if we thought of that first energy level as a place where a standing wave can exist around the nucleus, it can only exist in a particular way. So let me draw let's do a wavelength here. So it can exist in a particular way on that energy level. If we have another energy level, the electron can exist there too, but it can only exist if it's a standing wave, and it can only exist as a standing wave if it's a full multiple of another wavelength. So we have one wavelength here, or we have two wavelengths, but in between the two, the electron cannot exist. If it tries to, it collapses in not itself, and it doesn't exist anymore. So around an atom, we can have these, and so try to think of these, these as linear wavelengths, and then when we look at the atom itself, we're trying to make it look two-dimensionally, which also is not correct, but it's a way of thinking of it. Um, we're trying to make it look as a, like a two-dimensional wave. Um, and the point is that the electrons can only exist as multiples of wavelengths. So you can have one standing wave, or two standing waves, or three standing waves, but you can't have one and a half, or you can't have 2.7 standing wavelengths, because if the electron tries to exist as anything but a full standing wavelength, it collapses in on itself and ceases to exist. So the reason why the Bohr model of the atom has specific energy levels for the electrons to exist on and nowhere in between is because electrons have wave-like properties and they have a limited way to exist. They can only exist as standing waves and so it limits their places where they can exist around the nucleus. And this agrees with what we saw with our spectral lines. So if we imagine a particular element having only certain spectral lines, instead of having all the lines of the entire rainbow, it can only have specific places where energy is given off because the electrons themselves can only exist in specific spots. So when they go from one place to another, we see a specific amount of energy being given off and not a continuous line spectrum. So we get particular places for the electrons to exist around the nucleus, and that's how we got to the Bohr model of the atom.